Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So like I mentioned at the beginning of service, we're starting a new series called Say What? That's not in the Bible. And some of you maybe remember this from like back last March and April, right when COVID kind of hit. I remember I preached one of these sermons in my backyard for one of the live streams that we were doing back then. And uh, we had this theme where we looked at these common Christian phrases that Christians often say that actually aren't in the Bible. And we looked at a few of them back then. We're going to look at some different ones over the next couple of weeks. But the idea is that oftentimes we think as Christians that there are these things that we believe that actually aren't in the Bible. And sometimes they're actually contrary to what the Bible actually says. So this week, the common Christian phrase we're looking at, and then we're going to dig into the scriptures and see what the Bible actually says, is this one, and Abby kind of talked about it in the children's message. The devil made me do it. Anybody ever heard that one before? Anybody ever used that one before? Right, we can say, say what? That's, that's not in the Bible anywhere. But when you, when you think about this phrase, the devil made me do it, when do you typically use it or hear people use it? Right? When they've done something wrong and they got caught, right? Right? They typically don't do it when they're doing something wrong, but when they get caught from doing something wrong, they go, oh, I don't know, I kind of got wrapped up in things. The devil made me do it. And like Ms. Abby said in the children's message, right? Adam and Eve, who do they blame? The devil, right? The devil made me do it. And I think we have this idea, right, where we have like this angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other shoulder, right? Has anybody ever pictured your life like that? Maybe like this, something like that, right? You got, you got the angel on one shoulder, you got the devil on the other shoulder, and the angel whispers the good stuff you're supposed to do, the godly things you're supposed to do, and if you listen to the, the voice of the angel, that's good, but you better not listen to this little, little demon guy on this side, right? The devil made me do it. And I think we have this idea that the devil's out there and that we can't resist him sometimes. And I want to start off first by saying I do not want you guys to take away that the devil is not out there, the devil is not powerful. There are spiritual evil forces that are out there. The devil is real, right? That's not the point of this sermon, right? The devil is real. The tempter is out there. The great accuser is out there and real, But can we blame him every time we do something wrong and say, well, the devil made me do it? I think sometimes that's what we like to do, right? We we sin, we fail, and we say, oh, I got kind of wrapped up in that one thing. I was kind of going along with the crowd, but the devil made me do it. The Bible says things like this from our, our lesson today. Every good and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation of shadow due to change. Right? And we can see in the Bible, it actually says, all the good stuff in life, where does it come from? It comes from God. Right? Everything good in your life comes from God. And I think we think, well, then the opposite must be true. Everything bad in our life must come from the devil, must come from the guy on the other side. But is that actually what the Bible says? I think that's our go-to when we got caught up in doing something wrong. Maybe we don't say the devil made me do it, but I think I've often heard, well, I was just kind of going along with the crowd, right? Everybody else was doing it, right? And we typically kind of get wrapped up in this, and we try to shift blame when we get caught for doing something wrong, Right, probably an extreme example would be maybe, maybe you didn't like a song or the sermon from last week, or maybe you were upset that the microphone wasn't working last week for the sermon. So you said, you know what, I'm going to go show that pastor of mine, I'm going to go get a pack of eggs, right, and I'm going to go over to his house, and I'm going to throw the eggs at his house. Well, then when my neighbor with a famous ring security camera sees you doing that and reports you to the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, and you get arrested, and you sit in a little confessional booth with the detective there, and you tell him, the devil made me do it. Is he going to take that? Does that work? Not really. Right? It's just us shifting our blame. 
So what does the Bible actually say, right? We're looking at James chapter 1. Everything good comes from God, but what about the evil things? What about the bad things that we do? Does it mean that it all comes from the devil? Let's look at what the Bible actually says. So here in the book of James, just a little bit before that, James has some good things here. He says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. That's a good thing, right? God does not tempt you, right? God does not tempt you. God does not want you to fail, right? He does not take delight in tempting you and causing you to fail. God tempts no one. Now, he might allow you to go through a trial, or a, a different type of suffering where you might feel like you're being tempted, but actually it's a time when actually your faith grows and you grow closer to God. God uses that to bring you closer to him. God will do things like that, but he will not tempt you. God does not want you to fall, or God does not want you to fail. And then James continues. So God doesn't tempt you. That's pretty clear. That's good. That's good that that's in the Bible. But he says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then the desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So when we are tempted, right, does James say, well, the devil made you do it? Is that what he says? What does James say? We are enticed by our own desire, right? Each person, when they are tempted, is enticed by their own desire, right? He doesn't say the devil made you do it. He says you got something inside of you where you are making a conscious choice. You, you have agency where you are able to make a choice and you are making a bad choice that is causing harm or evil in the world, in other words, that, that evil that's out there, sure, sure Satan's out there, sure the accuser's out there, but that, that same force of evil lives within your heart. We call that our sinful nature. James would call that our evil desires, and we can't get away from that. Right? I think of, of Jesus and Barabbas. Right? When Jesus is arrested, this is probably one of my saddest parts of the whole passion narrative of Jesus. And I think a lot of people, when they think of Barabbas, this man of the insurrection, this, this revolutionary, right, who was a criminal, who probably had killed people. And they've got Jesus arrested, and Pilate says, you know what, I can release for you one person. Who do you want me to release? And remember what they say? The crowd says, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. And they say, well, what should I do with Jesus, the king of the Jews? And what does the whole crowd say? Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And it breaks my heart. Right? And when I read that, I say, you know, I, I couldn't possibly do that. But when you think about it, right, those people that are crying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, they're not saying the devil made me do it. Each one of those people, as they go along with the crowd, is making their own decision. And I think that's why that part of the passion narrative is, is so difficult because we see ourselves in that crowd where our sinful nature comes out and, and we go along with the crowd. We, we blame other people for the evil that we bring into the world. And that's a scary thing because in reality, right, we have to admit that that evil sinful nature is inside of us and we're enticed by our own evil desires, and that causes us to fail. And that's a scary thing to think about, and as I was thinking about this, I thought about a meme that I'd seen all over social media the last couple months that comes from a British comedy skit. It's kind of like Saturday Night Live, like a British version of Saturday Night Live, and this skit has two guys that are in the Nazi German army towards the end of World War II. And I think this is a realization that many of us come to or maybe we need to come to. And I'm going to go ahead and try to play this. I think it's going to play automatically here. So let's see if this works, actually. Yeah. Uh, Hans, I've just noticed something. These communists are all cowards. <laughs> Have you looked at our caps recently? Our caps? 
They've got skulls on them. Hmm? I don't, uh... Hands. Are we the baddies? Has anybody seen that one before? Right, going around social media. Hans, are we the baddies? Right, when they realize that they're the actual evil ones. I think because of our sinful nature, that's our story. We realize that we're the baddies. We're the ones that have that evil inside of us. And the question is, what do you do with that? Right? Some of us are tempted to blame other people. Right, that's, that's our natural temptation. That's what Adam and Eve tried to do. They tried to blame each other, then they tried to blame the serpent. Can we say, well, the devil made me do it? Is that what the Bible calls us to do? You see, I think it's interesting. Here at Messiah, every single Sunday, we begin our service, and the first part of our service, with a confession. And you want to know one thing that the, that's never in the confession? The devil made me do it. Right? We never say that. What do we say in our confession? You can look at it today. You can look at, if you know the kind of common confessions that we use in the Luther, Lutheran church, it's, I have sinned against you, Lord. Right? I, 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 me, me, me. Right? I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by the things that I have done and by the things that I have left undone. It's me. I'm the baddie. Right? That's a scary thing to realize, that you have that evil inside of you. But this is what he says. This is what God says. Right? I like this in 1 John. This comes from our liturgy too, but it comes from the Bible. John says here, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us from all, of our, our, all, all unrighteousness. Right, so when we realize that we're a baddie, what do we do? We don't say the devil made me do it. We, we own up to it. Lord, I've sinned against you. Lord, I'm a baddie. I, I'm the guy that has messed up and I have failed miserably, Lord. And God is faithful and just and forgives you and cleanses you of all unrighteousness. That's what Jesus does. Right, you see, Jesus is tempted in every way you and I are. Right? We had that in our gospel lesson. They, they bring Jesus out to the wilderness and they tempt him with power. They tempt him with food. They tempt him with prestige. And to each one of those temptations, Jesus refutes it with the word of God. He does not give in. And he lives in a world that is full of evil, trying to trap him, trying to bring him down. And he does not give in to a single one of them. He lives completely faithfully to his Father in heaven focusing on his love for you, those of us who are the baddies, and he goes and he hangs on a cross and he dies, right? And as he's hanging on the cross, as he's dying, Satan thinks he's won, right? Satan thinks he's finally gotten the Son of God down. He's hanging on a cross. There's no way he can possibly win. Evil is going to win, it looks like the sin in your own heart is winning because Jesus is hanging there because of that. But thanks be to God, Satan doesn't win. Thanks be to God, your sin and your evil does not win because Jesus himself is raised to life for you. Satan can't keep him down. Your own sin can't keep him down. He is raised to life and he forgives you and he cleanses you from all unrighteousness. If you're talking like those two British comedians, he cleanses you from being that baddie. I guess that makes you a goodie. I'm not quite sure. Right? That's what Jesus does. And I love what the Apostle Paul says about Jesus. Right? He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. In Jesus, this is what God has done for you. He's transferred you from that darkness into the kingdom of his beloved Son, and here's the thing, right? When you get caught doing something bad, if you say the devil made me do it or somebody else made me do it, you diminish what Jesus has done for you. Right? God's pretty clear. He is there to forgive you. He is there to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And he's done it on the cross. So be freed from that. Be freed from your sin. Be free from your baddiness, knowing that Jesus has forgiven you. That he is faithful and just and cleanses you from all unrighteousness and he transferred you from that kingdom of darkness to that kingdom of light and live in that light live under that freedom 
knowing that Jesus has set you free, not just from the devil, but also from your own sin. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.